I'm not going to say too much to introduce this speaker because I guess everything, um, he kind of introduced himself in some ways. If I just say his name and invite him to the stage, I think we're going to be going there. Jamie DeWolf. <laughs> So what I'm going to do first is, uh, I'm going to, a couple people asked me to do it, so I'm going to perform a piece that I did recently, um, got a lot of notoriety, and then after that I'm going to talk about, I don't know, whatever, um, and wander and, and, uh, and then also take some questions. Um, so I'll just go ahead and go into it. Um, I also, I just, I just want to say personally though that uh, it takes a lot of guts for a lot of the people who've gotten up here. So can we get another round of applause for everyone? Here? It hasn't been conveyed enough. It's obviously very dangerous to speak on this subject, and I myself am more than highly aware of that. And so, uh, you know, I just have to give a lot of love um, to all the guts um, that it takes to get up here. So. I will endanger myself now. Uh, all right. Do the same thing. This mic is waggly. Do I need to use this? I don't, need, I don't really need a mic. Do I need a mic to record it? All right. Every family has their black sheep. On our mother's side, our black sheep was a shepherd who enslaved his own flock. The king of the cons, a man who made himself a messiah, even though he never called himself a god. Even today, his words are written in steel tablets in a nuclear reinforced bunker hidden miles underground, so if our whole species goes extinct, his words will still survive. He was a subject we never talked about at the kids' table at family reunions, but he was my great-grandfather, L. Ron Hubbard. Lafayette Ron Hubbard. He started as a storyteller, a science fiction writer, a golden-tongued grifter who could write a book in any genre while the publisher waited downstairs in the hotel lobby. Just another name on Don Slore pulp mags paid only a penny a page until 1949 when he said, you want to know how you really get rich? You start a religion. <laughs> a year later, pretty good, right? A year later, he kept to his word, wrote Dianetics, transforming science fiction into fact until you could pay to flatline your mind for a fee. Overnight, he went from pennies to a profit until the world demanded to see his evidence. But Elrond knew if you don't have facts, all you need is faith. So he transformed his science into a religion, and Scientology was born. A few years later, his son arrived. A baby who avoided an early abortion attempt born premature at two pounds, two ounces, abandoned while his father sought fame and fortune. Now he emerged to take his part of the new family business. He was my grandfather, L. Ron Hubbard Jr. Carrying his father's name and red hair became his right-hand man and was a disciple helping to construct the church for years until he realized he was only another accomplice. Trained in the arts of electrified hypnosis, beatdowns, and blackmail, it took him a decade to see the holes behind the holy, the man behind the myth, his father. Stuffing thousands of dollars in his shoebox he kept hidden underneath his bed, his father. Burning incriminating documents before dawn, his father. Escaping from state to state as he watched his friends, brains washed, banks broken. Sickened by what he had seen behind the curtain, in 1959, Junior left. But his father always understood retribution better than redemption. So he stalked his son with break-ins, death threats, Junior coming home to his mailbox full of photographs of his children playing alone and, on, and, alone and unguarded on empty playgrounds to remind him the eye of the pyramid Never blinks. That's why all my aunts and uncles are taught how to use a gun. The son, forced to live like his father, permanently on the run until he changed his last name from Hubbard to DeWolf. A lie 
to protect him from ever having to tell the truth again. When your father has created a religion in your lifetime, there's no son big enough to ever escape his shadow. But there's a thin line between prophecy and psychosis. And the barefaced Messiah ran from criminal charges in countries and international outlaw on his ship, escaping extradition, his sanity slipping until he could no longer tell his own biography from fiction until one day he vanished before a courtroom or a jail cell could ever make him real again. Junior, now buried in debt, litigated the Holy Ghost to prove he still had flesh. Junior took his war public to scrape the idol's gold down to rust. Junior, now a dying diabetic with an amputated foot, battered by a decade of lawsuits against the man who carried his same name until the night his father died in hiding, cremated in the morning, leaving only a legacy of ashes. So the church gave the son their final offer. Arrest your tongue. Swallow the truth for one last check. Or you and your next of kin will suffer a lifetime of threats. So he swallowed his tongue and took his secrets and two heart attacks to his grave. Just another victim the church stopped pretending to save. On Thanksgiving, in a house a self-made God paid for, his great-grandchildren never said his name. He was the one God we never gave grace to. When my grandfather was still alive, one day he led me to a volume of books written by his father, and he said, So, your mom says you want to be a writer. Well, don't believe everything you read, <laughs> but believe everything you say. I never met the man who gave me my red hair and the manic depression still snaked in the strains of my DNA. And the first time I saw a psychiatrist, and he asked me if mental illness runs in my family, I said, yeah. <laughs> Around, I'm asking questions about me, 
And people were just telling me, like, well, what's going on? And I didn't really know because it had just gone online. I wasn't really aware that it had been out there in the world. And then one day, thankfully, I was at work. And uh, two people arrived, uh, I believe it was a man and a woman. And they, or it might have been two men, I'm not sure. Um, they arrived at my mom's house. And they had actually gone to my ex-girlfriend's house. We had just recently broken up. And uh, they had given her this cover story that they were poets that were doing a show with me. Right? And then they were trying to just fly me to discuss details and logistics of said show. And she was like, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, he's staying at his mom's house currently right down the street. And so they came to my mom's house. My brother answered the door. They gave him the same whole cover story. They're doing a show with me, this and that. And he was confused because he did a lot of shows with me. He didn't know what they were talking about. He couldn't, he, he couldn't identify any kind of details or information. And then my mom came to the door, and she said she could kind of recognize them immediately. Those in the know know that these are probably OSA agents. These are the very few people that Scientology would send to deal with someone like me. And um, she knew right away. She was like, what are you here for? And they're like, well, we're, we want to know about a show that you know, we're doing. She's like, that's, that's a lie. You know, like, you have nothing to do with the show. With them. What are you here for? And then they said, well... Oh, okay. Uh, did you, were you aware that he was claiming to be the great-grandson of L. Ron Hubbard? And she said, yeah. And you're talking to L. Ron Hubbard's granddaughter right now. And they're completely taken aback. And she just started roasting him and told him, you know, he was a con man and a pathological liar and get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> and they left. And I don't know what would have happened if they would have encountered me. And I always wondered about that. I'm a pretty temperamental fellow, and uh, thankfully I've never been bull baited actively because I'm from Oakland and I don't play that shit. Uh, 